truth about love, what we shall be. John is explaining that to us. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. John continues teaching us truth and links all of it to Jesus Christ. John starts off chapter 2 with a very tender-hearted phrase, my beloved, my little, my young children. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may be sure that we're in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you've heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Lord, help us to understand your word and be willing to apply it to our hearts. Help us to have no pockets of resistance uh, in our hearts and minds as we receive your word today. We pray that the Lord Jesus would be glorified and honored as a result of our response to his word, for we pray it, Lord Jesus, in your name, amen. About 15 years ago, CNN reported a story uh, by, uh, about a man by the name of Jerry Lynn who was trying to figure out how to get a hole in his wall to run a wire to his TV. So he got a bright idea of how to figure out how to do that. He, he borrowed his wife's little digital uh, clock, and he went upstairs in, in the attic, and he dropped it down uh, somehow through the wall, and he set the alarm for 10 minutes after he dropped it down. So uh, it, he dropped it down, and it, it went a little further than he thought it was going to go, but nevertheless, it worked perfectly. The alarm went off. He drilled his hole, he got his wire in, and and he was real excited about that. Next morning, or next evening, at 7.40, the alarm went off, and the alarm clock in the wall. And he thought, oh, didn't think about that. And for the next 13 years, (laughs) that alarm clock went off in the wall at 7.40 every evening. Now, for a while... He kind of figured the batteries would wear out in it, and he said, we'd got to the point we didn't notice it anymore, but it was a little bit embarrassing if you had company in the house because it echoed all through the downstairs. You could hear that alarm, and so they had to explain the story again and again. Finally, two years ago in July of 2017, it, came too much, it became too much to bear because it appeared that the battery was never going to quit. So they cut into the wall and removed the clock. But they didn't throw it out. It's now on their mantle, set at the same amount of time. They did turn the alarm off. But uh, it was a reminder to them of be careful what you do. And, I, and I, I, I thought about that, and I suppose their way of dealing with their mistake, I guess that's one way to do it, sort of just hope it doesn't go off again or the battery wears out, but for 13 years they lived with this. And now it's a conversation piece. It's no big deal. But you see, sin is really a big deal. And and we can't afford to let it lie in the wall and keep going off 
we learned last week what to do when you sin. And John is now real concerned that they don't misunderstand him because lest you and I become comfortable with that alarm clock going off every day, every day, every day, every day, with the whole idea of sinning and confessing as sort of a cycle, as if it's just standard procedure. I know there are a lot of churches that practice this. They sin, they do this, they confess, they sin. But John warns us about being casual about that because God has an answer, as He always does. And He wants us to understand that His love, that the love of God, the agape love the Bible talks about, is a way that deals fully with our sin. You could almost get the impression after our study last week that you could actually, as long as you confess your sins, everything is okay. You don't have to worry about dealing with stopping your sin. John's whole goal is to move God's people away from sin. Listen to this. Hear it up. We don't have to sin. Say it with me. We don't have to sin. I know sometimes in the back of our minds we get the idea because I'm a Christian I still have a sin nature and sin is inevitable. We've learned that. That we sort of give up the fight. So, oh well, I can't do anything about it so mm, it comes, it sins, I'll confess and, and we'll be okay. For some of you there are certain sins that have held you captive for a long time. And the idea of not sinning to you seems absolutely impossible of overcoming some of those sins. It's like an uphill bike ride. As you, as you further go up the hill, the pumping gets harder. Even when you shift down, it gets harder and harder. And sometimes uh, it, it gets foggy. And you don't know whether you're close to the top of the hill, whether you've, whether you've won the ascent or not. And so the temptation is when you're, when you're fighting sin, it's like riding this bike and, and, and you get almost to the top and you don't even know you're close to the top. And he says, man, this is just too hard. So you turn around, you coast the bike back downhill. And uh, what we don't realize is that often when we give up the struggle, we're almost at the point of victory. You see, the thing that we have to remember is that God is there to give us strength. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no testing, temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tested above your, your, your spiritual ability given by the Spirit of God. But will with that testing make a way to escape so you can bear it? So really we don't have the excuse to keep on sinning, though we use those excuses. And God gives us the strength to resist, not only by the presence of His Spirit and His promise, but by His very Word, the Word of God. Psalm 119, 9 through 11 says, When I give attention to the Word of God, I am able to have victory over sin. You know these verses. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your Word. I often wonder how, why the psalmist used the term young man. Do, do you suppose that, the, that a young man growing up to assume responsibility and leadership is the most vulnerable to temptation of all the age groups and all the identities of men? Perhaps so. Because when you read the book of Proverbs, Solomon writes to his sons, to young men. He goes on to say, "...with my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments." I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And what makes this work, what makes the word of God work, what makes the strength of God through the spirit of God work in our battle with sin is what Jesus Christ did on the cross. His death on the cross is what gives us this, this ability to no longer allow sin to be a victor in our lives. And we're going to see that this morning. John's going to talk a great deal about love from here on out in this letter because the truth about God's love impacts the practice and confession of our sin. So in chapter 2, John reveals the truth about love in two dimensions. And, and these dimensions of God's love, I think, are incredibly encouraging to us as we struggle with the issue of sin. Look at the first one. It's in verses 1 through 6. This first dimension is this. He tells us about the generosity of God's love to us. It's found in Christ. You want to know how generous God's love to us is? All you have to do is look at Jesus Christ and you understand the generosity of God's love. 
God's love is found in Christ, first of all, as our advocate. Jesus Christ is our advocate. Do you realize God provided for us a lawyer in Jesus Christ? We need a defense lawyer. Now, why do we need a defense lawyer? Very simply, folks, because we're guilty. If you aren't guilty, you don't get brought, well, you could get brought into trial, I suppose, but if the evidence comes out, but we're guilty, we know it. We need someone that, who can defend us, someone who can intercede for us. You see, this word that is unique to John, advocate, is an interesting word. It, it has the whole idea of someone who comes alongside to help. It's the same word Jesus used to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit after he went to heaven. The Spirit of God is going to be your, your advocate, your, your intercessor. We read in Romans chapter 8 that the Spirit of God intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. But in heaven today, even though the Spirit of God is in me and is interceding, in heaven I have an advocate because Jesus is there literally, personally pleading my case every moment of every day in my earthly life. That's what Jesus does for every believer in the court of heaven. Now, why in the world is that necessary? Well, there are two reasons it's necessary. Number one, because we have an enemy fighting us. We have an enemy fighting us. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 says that Satan is the accuser of the brothers where he literally daily comes to the throne of God and attacks the people of God. You see what they did? 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 Disparaging and discrediting the people of God and the work of God in the people of God is saying, man, God, you're a failure. Do you see that? But here's the beauty of the thing. When Satan accuses us before God, and Jesus stands right there beside us as our defense, and he pleads with God on our behalf, and in the court of heaven he says, you know, you're right, they're guilty, but here's what you need to know. Their sentence has already been paid. They're free. I paid. I paid for their sin. I paid for their guilt. I paid. And my payment was the sentence they deserve, and they're free. Wow. Wow. But there's another accuser that John talks about later in 1 John. It's in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. Just slip over there and look at these words. Chapter 3, verse 20, he talks about being assured in our hearts about God's work in Christ. We may have doubts about that. For whenever our heart or our conscience condemns us, look at this, wherever our heart or conscience condemns us, God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. Our confidence is in the work of Christ that God ordained on the behalf of sinners. That's Jesus standing up and saying, when you have doubts, when you have things come into your heart and mind about what I've done and whether it's going to last and whether it's going to help you and whether you're actually going to make it, I want you to remember this. I am greater than what your heart tells you. Wow. So it really comes down to this. Do I believe my heart or do I believe the Word of God? I've had people say to me, I want to trust Jesus as my Savior but I'm not sure that I'm sincere. You ever had anybody tell you that? I'm not sure that I, I can do that. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm really being truthful. And I've had to say to them, you got to stop, tr stop trusting your heart. Jeremiah chapter 7, 17 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately incurable. Who can know it? You can't know your own heart. You don't even begin to think you can know your own heart. All you can do is the, the best you can in sincerity and, and humility come to Jesus Christ and say, I'm a sinner. I don't trust my own heart. I know what my heart is capable of doing, but I know I need you and I'm opening my heart to you and I'm putting my trust in you as best I can as my Savior. And the confidence that we have 
is the confidence in the Word of God, not in the confidence in my heart, because my heart is deceptive. And that's what John wants us to understand. The, the thing that we see Jesus doing, here's the picture John is painting. Sin is the issue. Forgiveness is the goal. And the picture is that a courtroom in heaven and God the Father is sitting up in the place of the judge and my defense attorney, Jesus, is sitting by my side and the prosecuting attorney, Satan, and my conscience or my heart comes regularly before the God to accuse me and Jesus stands up and says, everything is true, but here's what I've done and God has accepted it. Hebrews 7.25 says, wherefore he's able also to save them to the uttermost, to the end result, as far as you can go, that come to God by him, seeing, here it is, he lives to make intercession for them. And he does more than just argue a good argument. He reminds the court that the penalty has been satisfied and my sentence has been commuted because of Christ. Now, the three reasons he can, he can advocate for us. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to miss this. Three basic reasons why you can't do your own advocacy, why somebody else in the congregation can't be an advocate for you, why the church can't be an, ad, an advocate for you, why, why no matter of religious practice or good works can be an advocate for you. Here are the three reasons why only Jesus can be an advocate for you. Number one, he understands us. You know, there, there's some of you, I've been your pastor many years, I still don't get you. I still don't <laughs> understand you. I love you, but man, sometimes I can't figure you out. And you're probably thinking the same thing about me. Man, I'm, you've been my pastor, I still can't figure you out. But you see, there's one that understands us. Because Jesus became the God-man. He truly became a man without ceasing to be God, without inheriting our sin nature, but he went through what it was to be human, truly human. He, 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 he wept, he got tired, he got hungry, he slept, he worked, he lived in the conditions in this earth. He was truly man. And so if anybody gets us, it's Jesus. That's why 1 Timothy 2, 5 is so precious. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Oh, he gets me. He understands me. Number two, by the way, you don't even understand yourself sometimes. You ever ask yourself a question, why did I do that? That was a dumb thing to do. How many ever done that? Let me see. Okay, yeah, you get it. So you really don't even know yourself. Number, the second reason Jesus can do this, he understands God. <laughs> he understands God. Why? Because he is God. Hebrews 4.15 and John 10.30. I and the Father are one. John 8.58, before Abraham was, I am Yahweh's name. So amazingly, listen to this amazingly, the judge, God the Father, and the defense attorney, Jesus Christ, are on the same page. They're one in thought and action, both holy, both righteous, both demanding justice, and both finding it completely satisfied in the death of Christ. Wow. He understands God. He understands man. But there's one other thing that qualifies Jesus to be our advocate. Here it is. Here's the third reason. He understands sin. He understands that sin is a real problem. The wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. Somebody, has, every time sin is committed, death occurs. And for God to take it away in Christ, he had to bear that. He died on the cross. The perfect for the imperfect. The guilty for the innocent. The sinless for the sinner. That's what God did in Christ on the cross. There is no alternative. It has to be paid. God must be consistent with His holy and righteous nature, yet God loves the sinner and desires His release. Only the death of Christ brings those two foreign objects together in harmony so that God can love us and forgive us and still remain righteous and just and holy. It's the only way it will work. 
Paul Westfall, the former coach for Seattle Sonics, put it this, put it this way. Being a Christian is not an ego thing. A lot of people accuse Christians of claiming salvation, then thinking that makes them better than anybody else. You know, it's actually just the opposite. We simply know that we have a sin problem, and we know who can fix it. And I would add, and it isn't us. It isn't us. The generosity of God's love to us is found in Christ as our advocate. How generous of God to provide the perfect advocate, knowing we need it all our earthly lives. Because, what does verse 1 say of chapter 2? I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin, but if anyone sins. Oh, John's realistic. He understands. He's not excusing him, but it's going to happen. And he says, here, here's God's generosity and his love to provide an advocate for us so that we can keep on going without guilt pushing us under the ground while we live here. And then what's beautiful to me is the generosity of God's love to us is also found in Christ as our propitiation. Now there's a word for you. Look at the word here. We have an advocate of the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He, circle the word, he, not it, not them, it's a person, it's only one person, it's exclusive. He is, all through the Bible, there's only one propitiatory sacrifice, and that's Christ. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, propitiation has two sides to it. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you the two sides. I'm going to give you the definition, show you the two sides. The word propitiation, just simply write it down, means satisfaction, to be satisfied. It's interesting that this word was a place that spoke of having the anger of someone who was offended get settled, get satisfied. All right, let me give you just a real simple example. Uh, I'll, I'll pick on one of the fellows here, Jim, I'll pick on you. Let's say your, your SUV uh, I go out there and I, uh, I take a, a sledgehammer to it. I just beat the tar out of it all over the place. Lori is over there writhing on the ground. You know, I can't believe my pastor would do this. So, you know, all this is going on. And I lay it down and I said, you know, Jim, I'm sorry. But I tell you what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a million dollars. Would you be satisfied with that or do you want that wreck of a car back? You like to see the money. <laughs> Figures. Okay, get this. Get this. I'm going to use your phrase. Jesus showed God the money. And God said, that'll do it. That'll do it. You get it? That's propitiation. That's satisfaction. Now, this, this word propitiation literally in the Greek if you, if you just put it over directly into English, it comes out mercy seated. Mercy seated. The word propitiation is translated in Hebrews 9, 5 like this. Above it, speaking of, of the Ark of the Covenant, above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, overshadowing the propitiatory. So remember what happened in the Ark of the Covenant? In the tabernacle, later in the temple, once a year, the high priest would go in with the blood for the atonement, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, which was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, where the cherubim were over top of that. And once a year, he would go in and make atonement for the sins of the people. An innocent lamb died for the guilty of the people to foreshadow the time when Jesus would come and actually do that. And Jesus would be mercy seated on our behalf. How incredible that God was satisfied with Christ's death for all of our sins. What an incredible, incredible, wonderful act of God. I want you to understand how incredible propitiation is. Dave Furman in his book, Kiss the Wave, tells the story of Kelly Renee Gissendander. Gissendander, Kelly was an American woman who was executed um, by the United States, uh, the United States of uh, uh, the Court of Georgia, she had been convicted of orchestrating the murder of her husband with her lover. 
Uh, the, uh, the time of the murder, she was 28 years old. Her husband was 30. After her conviction, uh, they, it came out in the trial that they, uh, her boyfriend took her husband out in the, in the woods and killed him, and then they burned all the evidence uh, of that have happened. And uh, so she was convicted, tried, and sentenced to death. She was the only woman on death row in Georgia, I think even up till just recently. But her story is really remarkable. You see, Kelly came to know Christ on death row. She, she completed the Bible program and theological studies and began witnessing to many of the inmates. She often testified that she was in awe that Jesus took her place on the ultimate death row. And this is what she often was heard saying in her testimony. And you can read it here. I have learned firsthand that no one, not even me, is beyond redemption through God's grace and mercy. I have learned to place my hope in the God I now know. The God whose plans and promises are made known to me in the whole story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. She learned firsthand that Jesus' death satisfied God's demands, no matter how wicked and awful her sin was. See, God's law demands penalty just like man's law does. And Jesus stepped up and took the sentence so that we could go free. And he demonstrates that love when we come to Jesus Christ and he saves us. Let me give you a theological understanding of propitiation. This is a very important sentence that will help crystallize what propitiation is. Here it is. Redemption is God's work on the cross in reference to my sin. Okay? Redemption is God's work on the cross in reference to my sin. While propitiation is God's work on the cross in relation to His righteousness. Redemption, me. Propitiation, God. Redemption washes my sin away and satisfies my need. Propitiation satisfies God about my sin and need. That's why redemption and propitiation are two rails the gospel train runs on, among others. Paul explains it this way in Romans 3, 24 and 25. And we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's our side. That's what God needed to do in order to, to bring about the cleansing of our sin. Look at the rest of it, verse 25. Whom God put forward as a propitiation. Now God is satisfied by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. That's simply another way of saying in, in His forbearance in the Old Testament He allowed people to make sacrifices and sacrifices as sort of a, sort of a uh, on credit kind of thing until Jesus actually came and paid the price and died on the cross. So propitiation answers the question, how can God reach out in love to me and save me as a sinner without compromising His holiness? Redemption and propitiation is how it happens. Now that's the first side of propitiation. Propitiation, Paul or John says, He's the propitiation for our sins. For those who trust Christ as Savior, He's the propitiation. But, but John isn't done. See, this magnitude of Christ's work is, is mind-boggling. Look at the next part. The second side of propitiation is he's the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, not just believers' sins. Now, wait a minute here. See, here, here is a theological point that I, want to, that I want to say to you, and I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, I'm a Calvinist. I, I believe in, in uh, of course, I believe a lot of those are, are biblical. However... Let me warn you about any theological system, you've heard me say this before, of trying to force uh, all the points into this grid and, and, and run around certain passages of Scripture in order to make it fit your system. This is where I have to be very, very careful. See, systems are man organi organizing the truth of God. 
Systems are not inspired. The Word of God is inspired. So when, when I come to this point, um, many of my friends uh, subscribe to what we call limited atonement. Now, I understand. I can fellowship with them. I understand where they're going. And ultimately, we get to the same place. Only the elect are saved. I believe that. The Bible teaches that. You can't get around that. However, to limit the scope of Christ's death, I think, flies in the face of passages like this. I know how they explain it. The world of the elect. And I've pointed out to my brothers, if he wanted to save the world of the elect, the world of the elect would have been in there. The way he uses the term world, you have to pay attention to. So let me, let me put it to you this way. There's a universal dimension to Christ's death for sins in the same sense that God, God's promise to Abraham, Abraham has a universal dimension. Genesis 12, 3 says, God said to Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you, and he who dishonors you, I will curse you. And listen to this. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here it is. Get it down. What John is telling us about propitiation for the sins of the whole world is that there's enough power and sufficiency in the death of Christ to save every single person in this world, past, present, or future. There's enough power in the death of Christ not to just release us from sin's penalty, but to turn away the wrath of God from sinners. I can freely proclaim the gospel to every person on the face of the earth without hesitation or reservation that if they turn to Christ, Christ will save them. Do we understand that? Will everybody turn and trust Christ? No. Is election real? Yes. Do I understand it all? No. Do I believe it? Yes. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20, Paul put it this way. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world, the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Now, if everybody was saved in the world, why does he need to trust the message of reconciliation be taken out to the world? That wouldn't be necessary. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The debt has been paid. The money's in the account. Go get it and receive it by faith. Repenting of your sins. It's available. It's there. It's done. Propitiation for the sins of the world. Satisfaction has been made. But unfortunately, not everybody in the world is going to turn and trust. And the Spirit of God is involved in that for Jesus' glory and God's glory. So let me say this. If Jesus is not your Savior, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, then you do not have an advocate and propitiation has not been applied to your life. And God is not satisfied until the death of Christ is applied to your life. John 12, 48 says, there's the alternative. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So, the generosity of God's love, listen carefully, very simple. The generosity of God's love to us is found in Christ as our advocate, in Christ as our propitiation, and number three, it's found in Christ as our assurance. Look at verses 3 through 6. And by this we know, know that we've come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but doesn't keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. Whoever keeps His word, in Him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may be sure that we are in Him. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which He walked. Now there's three simple things that we learn from this and we're done. Number one, obeying the Lord brings a deep assurance of our salvation. I find when people come to me who, have, who I believe have truly trusted Christ as their Savior but are doubting their salvation, almost 100% of the time it's because they have a faulty relationship with the Word of God. 
You see, lack of assurance of salvation stems from a lack of obedience to God's Word. If I say I know Him and I have little regard for the Word of God to obey it, John comes back again with the term liar and he says the truth is not in him. The Word of God is not working in him. That's a serious thing. Let me give you an example. If I'm in a room with a lot of women, never had that experience before, but if I am in a room with a lot of women and my wife is in that room, you ought to be able to tell which lady is my wife by watching my conduct. And if you can't, something is wrong. That's the way it is with assurance to us and to others. If I belong to Christ, and as a result I am in the light, because if you're in Christ, you're in the light, then my response to God's Word will be an overall response of obedience. Not perfect, I'm going to miss at times and falter, but the overall impression will be with someone who loves the Word of God, desires to obey the Word of God. That's why Paul said what he did in Romans 7, 21, 22. So Paul says, so I find it to be a principle that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, listen to this, in my inner being. The Word of God is working in me. Paul says, if you're not allowing the Word of God to work with you over time, the truth isn't in you, meaning you're not saved. Paul says, I've got this battle, but I look in me, and there's this delight of God and His Word in my heart. So, if you have no desire for the Word of God in your personal life, or you're coming to church to hear God's Word is a drag or sort of a conscience soother, and you don't have a hunger for the Word of God, you can go weeks and days as a Christian without reading the Word of God, then if you are saved, which may be very doubtful, but if you are, it might be you're going to have a problem with the assurance of your salvation. You either be deceived about it or you'll be worried about it, one of the two. So obeying God's word, obeying God, brings a deep assurance of salvation. That's what Paul is saying in verse 3 and 4. This is how you know I have a desire for the word of God. Uh, when you have life in you, you have desire for certain things. If you're healthy, you have a desire to eat. If you're sick, you don't have a desire to eat. Something wrong, you don't have a desire to eat. Something wrong in your life, you can't function normally. It's the same way as a Christian. Secondly, look at verse 5. Obeying him brings a growing experience of God's love. Here John ceases. It's interesting. In verse 5, he changes his terminology. But whoever keeps his word, now he doesn't use the word command or commandments. He uses the word word, which tells me they're one and the same. They're interchangeable. And we know this from Psalms. If, you're, if you've at all read Psalm 119, you find all these different words for the word of God, one of which is commandments or commands. So John says, if I'm honoring the, the Word of God, the love of God is going to be seen flowing out of me to others. It's just, that's just normal. It's going to flow out of me to others. But if I'm struggling with loving the church or loving my brothers and sisters in Christ, then the love of God is not growing in me. And it could be that my salvation is either suspect or at the very least, my relationship with the Word of God is broken. When I counsel people who are having difficulties with somebody else in the church and believe it or not I've had counseling sessions like that one of the questions I like to ask tell me a little bit about your devotional life tell me about your journey with the word of God and inevitably something is broken in their relationship with the word of God and so if they're truly believers it's no wonder that all their concern is on me, me, and, and not on others in the body. It's simply the love of God is coming out of me to others more and more in a growing pattern. That's what, Paul, that's what John meant when he said this in verse 5, but whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. That means it's maturing, it's being complete, it's, it's accomplishing the purpose of, for which God wants, God put it there. He tells us in another passage of Scripture in Corinthians that, that the, the love of the Spirit is being, is being for, literally the word forced out of me or flowing out of me or abounding in me. And the reason that is happening is that I'm living 
in obedience to God's word. It, it goes hand in hand. If you're a believer in obedience to God's word, you're going to love the you're going to love the brothers. The love of God is going to be growing and it's going to be perfected. The pattern is going to be growing. And then the the, the third um, item that I want us to see is in verse six. In relation to the assurance the Lord gives us in Christ. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Abiding in him brings a clear path to our life journey. You know what? If you're living for Christ, it's absolutely, listen carefully, it's virtually impossible to hide it from an unbeliever. You just can't hide it from an unbeliever. Try as you might, you cannot hide it from an unbeliever. Jesus put it this way about abiding in John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who abides in me does his work, who dwells in me does his work. If I make the claim I'm living for Christ, abiding in him, then I'm going to stake myself to a certain ethical responsibility, namely to imitate Christ. That's, that's what he says in the last. Whoever says he abides in him, whoever says he's walking in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. The generosity of God to us in Christ is he has made Christ the test stone of our assurance. How am I doing in my walk with Christ? This means I don't just keep a list and check it off. It means I live out the whole life as in God's presence and enjoyment of his fellowship. We're going to stop there. 7 through 11, we're going to pick up next week. But let me just remind you of a couple things as we close. When I think of the generosity of God's love to us, I'm overwhelmed at the thought that I have an advocate that I am not worthy of. Do you know, you couldn't afford to hire Jesus to be your lawyer in the greatest case you would ever face. He absolutely can't be hired. He only comes when we trust him by faith. We have, a, we have a place where mercy is granted and God is satisfied. We have a propitiatory with Jesus. When I am in Jesus, God is satisfied with me. <laughs> Do you get that? Do you get that? Say it with me. When I am in Jesus, say the first part. When I am in Jesus. God is satisfied with me. It isn't your effort that gives you your identity. It isn't your position. It isn't isn't whether you're a pastor or not. It's just going to come a time. We've already know about this. We're going to talk about this when I'm no longer going to be the senior pastor here. Will I lose my identity? Absolutely not. My identity is I belong to Christ. I'm his follower. And, And no matter what I'm doing or where I'm going, that is paramount. That's what John is saying here. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way as he walked. We have a place of mercy. God is satisfied. We have an assurance because of Christ and because of his work on the cross. I can be assured of the truth of his word and in obeying it, I have a peace and rest about the state of my soul with my God. Oh, do we know we're not perfect? <laughs> oh, yeah. In fact, the closer you get to God, the brighter the light becomes and the darker the darkness looks in your life. The further away from the Lord you are, the more casual you can treat sin in your life. It's, you know, you don't get too bothered by it. But when you're walking in the light, the darkness of sin really shows up. And you know, boy, do I ever need an advocate. Do I ever need to confess my sins? Would you bow your heads in prayer? I want to ask you a simple question this morning. Do you really know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Can you, can you point back to a time when you repented of your sins and put your trust in Christ to save you? Or has there been a gnawing doubt in you where you really don't know whether Jesus lives in your life? I'm telling you, It's so important you need to settle that today. Don't don't just go on the fact, well, I prayed a prayer. Or, you know, I believe all that stuff. Have you entrusted your life to Christ? Have you stepped out by faith 
and turned away from your sins. You're no longer happy about it. You realize it's a serious thing. And, you, and you've turned away from your sins. That's repentance. And you've placed your trust in Christ alone to say you're not depending on whether your mama or papa was a was a preacher or a missionary or a godly person or your grandma was such a religious person you, you're not bringing that doesn't even come into the equation and if you bring it into the equation wait a minute here where's jesus and all of that you can be thankful for that but that's not what's going to save you and make you right with god it's it's when you repent of your sins and and you place your trust in jesus christ as your savior that's what saves you. Have you done that? Has that been settled in your life? Then if you're a child of God, let me ask you this. Have you been rejoicing in the fact that you have an advocate and a propitiatory sacrifice and an assurance in Christ? Do you, do you realize what he has done? Oh, I think all our lives we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. Lord Jesus, you know the state of all our hearts this morning. You know where we are. You know, Lord, what we need to do. Father, I pray you'd forgive me for the times that I have made light of these great truths. Lord, I'd like to think I didn't do it intentionally, but carelessly, ignorantly, and at times with being too preoccupied with other things. I pray you will help me with that, Lord. And I pray that all of us who know you We'll come to appreciate today what an incredible, incredible, generous love of God we have in Jesus Christ as our advocate and our propitiatory sacrifice and our assurance. And for those who do not know you, Lord, bring them to yourself. Open their eyes. Let them see the truth. Lord, please, don't, don't wait till they're on their last breath and the risk of dying without you and spending eternity in hell forever and ever. Please, Lord. And, and Lord, move us afresh today as your people, uh, that, Lord, we might have a fresh and eager desire to share the good news with people around us, for our neighbors and our friends. And, Lord, I pray that you would cause us to have that other consciousness that we live among people who face an eternal destiny, and it all depends on their relationship with Christ. Lord, we need your help. We ask for your help. And we give grace and mercy and thanksgiving to you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.